So I'll start uh, this afternoon's session um, with a discussion on um, what's the best approach to the initial therapy of peripheral T-cell lymphoma. Um, I'd like to uh, provide uh, a uh, ge general overview in terms of what's current status um, in terms of both conventional therapy as well as approach of moving novel agents into frontline uh, settings. So we start by reviewing uh, peripheral T-cell lymphoma. So based on the International T-cell Lymphoma Projects, uh, we know that it's a very rare and heterogeneous uh, lymphoma, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, with about 5 to 10 uh, percent in Western countries and a little higher, about 10, 15 percent in Asia. Um, of the 20 plus uh, different subtypes of peripheral T cell lymphoma, the systemic ones um, most prevalent included peripheral T cell lymphoma, NOS, angioimmunoblastic T cell lymphoma, and ALCL. So, with the exception of um, ALK positive ALCL, uh, the outcome of patients with T-cell lymphoma remains to be rather inferior compared with B-cell non-Hodgkin lymphoma counterpart. Uh, so the long-term outcome remains to be in the range of about 30 uh, percent for the most prevalent subtypes. Um, obviously, that can be further stratified based on the IPI score. Um, I do want to make a note that it seems like the title of the slides was not showing, so the formatting was looking slightly different from where it intended to be, um, but not um, to you know, dwell on this. Um, in terms of the current uh, 2015 NCCN treatment guideline for frontline therapy, you know, obviously for the um, ALK-positive uh, ALCL, CHOP21 or CHOIP21 are the uh, preferred uh, treatment with curative intent. However, for the other T cell subtypes, suboptimal sub sub therapy uh, essentially determines that there's no standard of care. So um, clinical trials are prioritized and consolidation autologous stem cell transplant are highly recommended for patients with high risk disease and chemotherapy uh, response. So, um, thank you, that's a whole lot better. So, what do we generally uh, get uh, with B-cell-derived uh, empirical therapy such as CHOP? Historical data suggest that the overall survival was in the range of about 60 to 80 percent, half of them CR. However, duration response remains to be rather poor, as you can see here. So, over time, strategies has been developed to improve upon CHOP, and they included adding new ingredients to the CHOP backbone, using entirely different alternative intensive regimen platforms, or uh, a frontline um, consolidation stem cell transplant, as well as incorporating novel strategy, which would be the focus of our discussion today. Um, before that, you know, let's review what's the uh, conventional therapy data um, that may potentially add ingredients in improving uh, response. So the benefit of adding etoposide to the CHOP backbone was uh, analyzed in a retrospective fashion. However, data was pulled from seven clinical trials uh, from the uh, German high-grade lymphoma study group. Those studies were prospective study. However, about 300 patients were extrapolated from those uh, data sets. And there was a preponderance of ALCL subtypes. Obviously, you also see the PTCL-AL. TL uh, subtypes. The retrospective analysis uh, suggests that there seems to be an improvement of event-free survival, but not overall survival, and that benefit was felt to be most uh, predominantly in younger patients less than 60 years of age with normal LDH, um, as well as, you know, with ALCL subtype of T-cell lymphoma. The uh, role of autologous upfront uh, stem cell transplant has been studied in numerous studies. There are a number of phase two uh, prospective studies on this particular subject. Uh, there were none of phase three studies, um, given the rarity of this particular disease entity. So the largest study uh, to date uh, is shown here. That is the uh, Nordic uh, Lymphoma uh, Group uh, 01 study. Uh, this particular study enrolled patients uh, with uh, 
Prefer T selling from 160 total sample size, which is the largest in its scale. The induction regimen used dose stands by weekly CHOIP supported by growth factor. The overall response rate of this particular regimen was 82% with complete remission at 51% and about 72% patients were successfully moved onto uh, autologous stem cell transplant consolidation. The total five-year overall, overall survival rate was about 51% and pro progression-free survival rate was 44%. Again, there's always a debate in terms of selection bias. However, uh, the efficacy as well as uh, survival rate compared with historical control without autologous stem cell transplant appears to be better, and there certainly remains to be room for improvement. So before we move on to discussing about novel agents and moving them into the frontline setting, I want to just uh, show two uh, recent studies, you know, basically a reality check and see what are we have been using in terms of frontline therapy for T-cell lymphoma, how that has really impacted on the outcome. Those are data uh, more recent than the lymphoma, uh, international lymphoma projects collected in the 2000s. The first one seems to be the best benchmark we have so far. It was a multi-center uh, U.S. study that's uh, essentially looked at data from from 341 new T-cell lymphoma patients. And the subtypes are listed here, as you can see, which seems to be fairly typical in terms of uh, incidence uh, for T-cell lymphoma. Majority of those patients treated in the academic center seems to be provided with uh, combination therapy, with CHOP being the most common at 70%. And however, a very small percentage, about 10%, moved on to consolidation autologous stem cell transplant. They reported a 73% overall response rate. The conclusion from this particular uh, retrospective analysis, although in a community setting, is that the outcome of T-cell lymphoma patients remains to be poor if you compare with B-cell counterpart, more work's needed. It doesn't seem to be any impactful practice has happened since the international T-cell lymphoma projects. The stem cell transplant population was rather small to derive any kind of meaningful conclusions. And finally, the uh, response to initial therapy particularly complete remission, remains to be a very strong predictor in terms of how patient would do eventually and stress the point that we really need to develop a strategy to achieve better response uh, up front. The second study um, was also recently published. It's a populational study uh, from the Swedish Lymphoma Registry Study. 755 uh, new PTCL patients and selected. It was analyzed here in the decade, in the 2000s, and uh, um, the incidence seems to be rather typical, and again, the majority of the patient seems to be provided with adequate combination uh, options with, again, CHOP-like regimen to be the most common. And uh, about 18% of the patients, which is over 100 of them, moved on to autologous stem cell transplant. The, um, the, the, the interesting analysis, I think, that was done in this particular patient uh, population-based study was that they did, um, in fact, looked into patients um, that, that are up to age 70 and relatively physically fit, so who potentially could be candidate for intensive therapy, including consolidation stem cell transplant, to really try to analyze uh, what is really the impact of high-dose therapy as consolidation. So here they looked at 252 patients among the over 700 patients, and uh, from that particular analysis, which appears to be the next best to randomized study, which we simply do not have, is that the multivariant analysis showed survival advantage for autologous stem cell transplant compared with those non-transplanted patients. And again, uh, the additional benefit of etoposide was corroborated also in this population study to go along with what was discussed earlier with the retrospective German study. And you'll see here with the autologous stem cell transplant population, 
the survival data looks remarkably similar to the Nordic lymphoma group uh, transplant study, and I assume that a lot of study subjects was derived from this particular population as well. So um, moving forward, how do we really modify treatment of T-cell lymphoma from a B-cell-based empirical adaptation to disease-based uh, therapy that's incorporating into frontline uh, thinking? So uh, this particular slide summarized uh, the uh, currently uh, approved uh, novel agents, biologics, for indications in T-cell lymphoma with the top four that have received FDA approval here, and then two other compounds was approved in Asia. We're going to be focusing, obviously, uh, discussing about compounds that are available here. They included the antifolate prilotrexate, uh, HDAC inhibitors, romadepsin, as well as bolinostat, and also the very first antibody drug conjugate, anti-CD30, uh, brentuximab, vedotin. So we start by discussing prilotrexate, which was the prototype and the earliest compound that had indications in relapsed T-cell lymphoma. In the uh, pivotal studies, um, the uh, prilotrexate was provided weekly dose for, four, uh, for six treatments with one week off, and patient was able to uh, derive a benefit overall survival in the range of 29% with CR rate and median duration of response at about 10 months. Month. The side effects included mucositis and myelosuppression. The um, addition of prilotrexate to a frontline uh, combination platform was experimented in this NCI Nebraska study where CEOP, which essentially replaced adriamycin with v VP16, was combined with prilotrexate. So in this particular regimen, patient would be getting CEOP for the first five days as uh, expected. Uh, then they would be getting weekly prilotrexate at day 15, 22, and 29. The cycle length is quite prolonged at six weeks, and patient can receive up to six runs of treatment. Um, consolidation uh, autologous stem cell transplant was permitted in terms of the uh, cl clinical study design. The small uh, phase two study here evaluated 33, patient, uh, thir 33 patients um, expected uh, median age 62 years and median treatment about four cycles. The conclusion here was that the overall response rate was about 70 percent and CR was about 52 percent. The investigator uh, thinks that the CR seems to be high enough to uh, warrant additional uh, investigations with combination uh, with prilotrexate. The next um, novel agent that are being experimented in the frontline settings is the brentuximab vedotin. You're all very familiar with this particular cartoon in terms of mechanism of action. So I would go right into just review some of the relapse data. In the uh, registration trial, single agent brentuximab vedotin um, in patients with CD30 positive ALCL showed a overall response rate of 86%. 86% CR rate of 57% at a standard dosing uh, regimen, which is 1.8 milligram per kilogram given every th uh, three weeks. Uh, the uh, side effects are uh, included neuropathy and very mild myelosuppression. In experimental settings, single agent brentuximab vedotin was also uh, provided to patients with non-ALCL T-cell lymphoma patients, and uh, it's a small phase two study again, 35 patients. The representative subtypes included ALCL, PTCL, and OS. The um, response rate was registered at 41% with a CR presence, and as you can see here in subgroup analysis in ALTL patients, the response rate seems to be a little higher at 54%, and interestingly, there does not seem to be a direct correlation in terms of response to the level of CD30 expression. The toxicities are very, very similar to what's observed in the um, ALCL initial study. So, Brentuximab 
map uh, vedotin has been combined uh, to the frontline uh, CHOP-based therapy. The phase one data has been uh, completed and reported as shown here. This particular phase one study essentially provides a brentuximab vedotin in two uh, treatment platform, either sequential or concurrent. In the concurrent settings, the vincristine, the CHOP backbone was omitted uh, to minimize neurotoxicity. Following response assessment, uh, patients were allowed to move on to additional uh, maintenance with single-agent brentuximab vedotin. And in this phase one study, within the two subgroups, the uh, treatment efficacy seems to be rather encouraging if you look at it, particularly in the combination uh, treatment group. And I do want to note that the combination group included uh, both ALCL as well as non-ALCL uh, patient cohorts for uh, 26 patients. So here you have overall response rate 100% and then CR rate 88%. The side effects profile seems to be rather similar to to the backbone of CHOP. Um, so um, based on, the, collectively based on this data, the randomized uh, study is, uh, you know, moving forward in, in full steam. Uh, I, I'm, I'm sure a lot of you are participants in those endeavors. So the randomized study essentially ex uh, compares the experimental arm of brentuximab vedotin with CHP, which without vincristine. Patients can receive up to eight cycles of treatment, and that's to compare with standard CHOP arm. And subsequent to that, the study design was rather flexible in that patients could move on to autologous stem cell transplant and follow as part of the natural history of outcome. And the primary objective was progression-free survival and uh, expected enrollment was over 400. Um, I, I believe we are uh, in, in the stage of ALCL accrual while non-ALCL arms are closing um, at this point. So it's, you know, the outcome is eagerly awaited and particularly given well-tolerated uh, profile uh, for patients treated on this particular study. Um, next, we move on to the novel agents of um, uh, HDAC inhibitor and their applications of moving to frontline. So, as indicated before, there's two uh, reagents. The first, obviously, with more uh, follow up data, was the selective HDAC inhibitor, romadepsin, which is provided weekly for three weeks with one week off. And the newer compound is a pan HDAC inhibitor, balenostat, which is given daily for five days straight. And then the cycle was every three weeks. Weeks. The efficacy data is, in fact, listed side by side for you to compare. So it looks like in the registration study, which are a very similar size of 130 patients, the efficacy gives about 26% overall survival rate and CR rate of you know 10 to 15%. But it's remarkable uh, that in in sub subgroups of patients re um, receiving romadepsin, some of those uh, response duration are really rather extraordinary. So it's over two years in some patients. Um, and uh, the uh, adverse events um, associated with HDAC inhibitor are generally myelosuppression, which can be adjusted by uh, dose uh, modifications. So based on those, um, you know, experience in the relapse settings, the combination of romadepsin has been moved uh, to combine with CHOP, and I think most of the data are coming from the LISA group uh, with French uh, leadership. So the phase 1B and 2 study was recently published in Lancet Hematology, and the schema is listed here. It's a very, um, you know, to be expected small study. Phase 1B, 18 patients, and phase 2, 19 patients. Essentially, the MTD for romadepsin was determined at 12 milligram per meter square, and that's to combine with standard dose of CHOP at day 1. Romadepsin was given for two weekly dose, day 1 and day 8. So the outcome, a total of 36 uh, seven patients were treated. The adverse event was somewhat to be expected with a combination of CHOP plus romadepsin. So here you can see that uh, uh, myelosuppression with infectious complications as well as some impact in terms of uh, constitutional uh, functionality here. The efficacy data 
uh, looks like it has a CR rate of 51%, um, and 18-month progression-free survival was uh, registered at 57%. So I think the CR rate and PFS rate um, allows this particular study to move on to a current ongoing phase three randomized study where romadepsin at 12 milligram uh, per meter square is combined with CHOP, with a comparator of CHOP, and I think it's also a very large study at 420 patients um, estimated, and I think it's accruing, um, not in U.S., I think it's a European, other global uh, regions. So what's available here in terms of romadepsin combination in the frontline settings? There is a investigator consortium where romadepsin is being looked at uh, maintenance following induction chemo CHOP-based plus autologous stem cell transplant. For patients who remains to be in remission following those procedures, they have the options of moving on to romadepsin maintenance, which is given once every two weeks. And the um, end point is to look at two-year progression-free survival following transplant. And... Um, the, the other uh, newer HDAC inhibitor, Belenostat, has also been studied first in the uh, phase one dose uh, finding uh, stage for a combination with CHOP, and I think with a goal of eventually moving on to uh, combination in randomized uh, fashion. I don't really have any data to share with you for this. So then, um, to, to, to be more thinking out of outside the box, so if the, the child-based backbone seems to be not optimal, and could we just kind of, you know, make a, a leap of um, faith and thinking about can we move biologics combination directly into frontline settings? Some of those uh, combinations has been tested in the relapse settings, and I think this is one particular study that was reported at the, the recent Lugano uh, conference with the combination of lenalidomide plus romadepsin. It's also a uh, consortium investigator initiated efforts. So in this particular study, lenalidomide was given day one to day 21, um, one, one week off, and then romadepsin was given weekly for three doses. The MTD was at maximum for each of the compounds, but in reality, when you're looking at the uh, outcome, that the median dose was needing to be reduced with ongoing and uh, continuous therapy. So romadepsin was at 8 milligram, and lenalidomide was at 15 milligram. The overall response rate in a, a fairly highly refractory resistant population was about 53% and uh, side effects was somewhat to be expected. So based on that, and we, you know, there's in fact a phase two upfront study that is completely chemotherapy free, utilized the combination of romadepsin plus lenalidomide. The design was very similar to the phase uh, one, two study that we just mentioned earlier uh, with a combination of romadepsin plus lenalidomide and accruing for patients with T-cell lymphoma. The objective here is to looking at preliminary efficacy and also particularly looking at um, you know, if that afford certain delays to cytotoxic chemotherapy, or at least not encouraging development of uh, chemo resistance subsequent to that. So, um, finally, uh, certainly the, uh, the, the the previous discussion is not meant to be uh, comprehensive. There are so many other uh, very uh, uh, new compounds and uh, with novel mechanisms out there that's being experimented in the relapse settings. But I do want to make a point of uh, looking at emergent data in terms of looking at cell signaling pathways, genomics, to really provide us with new clues and thinking T-cell lymphoma uh, in its own right, uh, where there are recurrent um, genetic mutations such as, you know, IDH2 or DNA methyltransferase or a type of mutations start to defining subtypes of T-cell lymphoma and also clinical pathways uh, along um, uh, JAK-STAT, um, mTOR, or NF-kappa-B are being elucidated as to how that's going to be impacting our, our uh, target selection and uh, evaluation for treatment. So um, to, to summarize, for the simple question of what is the best approach for initial therapy of 
T-cell lymphoma, that's a long discussion. And I think the bottom line is that we're still awaiting for a high impact practice changing um, platform for T-cell lymphoma. However, significant efforts has been made to understand uh, the biology and also applying a novel treatment compound into the frontline settings. Um, I want to uh, particularly mention that you know certainly we would encourage uh, referrals and also participation for clinical trials because that really is the best way of gaining uh, answers um, and in a sufficient sample size uh, to make any kind of meaningful uh, considerations. Now, outside of clinical trial where it's not accessible, certainly uh, CHOP alone is inadequate as initial therapy for most patients. For physically fit young patients, addition of ETO etoposide and also considering consolidation in first remission is highly desirable. Those are young, fit uh, patient, and novel agents in combination are being uh, um, provided in clinical trial settings more and more. So, um, and I think for a lot of you this morning, uh, in, in the uh, biology session, Dr. Ingerami at Cornell was talking about patient-derived xenograft, and we do have a concerted efforts at Cornell uh, to looking into T-cell lymphoma in, in terms of investigation and also testing for targeted therapy. So thank you for your attention.